I want us to look at uh, this passage from Luke 15, um, the prodigal son. I want to look at it this morning and again this evening. And uh, verse 24, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. The Bible is full of stories, isn't it? Wonderfully. All we can remember Adam and Eve, the temptation, the fall, the flood of Noah and the judgment and the deliverance of him and the creation. And then uh, the call of Abraham and uh, the patriarchs that follow him, Isaac and Jacob, the wonderful story of Joseph in Egypt. And then how Moses, 400 years later, delivers the children of Israel and uh, takes them to the promised land. Joshua leads them there. And then the setting apart of David to be the king and Solomon, the great division. And then the rising up of Elijah and Elisha and the wonderful things that they did. Full of stories. And our Lord Jesus told stories too. And perhaps this is um, the favorite of many of us. It's... uh, I think it's more accurate and more moving and more profound than if I just said what it is teaching. The picture he paints is so very evocative and open-ended and it hooks into a memory cell in our minds and once we've heard it, we, we never forget it. And we fall back on it when we forget some of the doctrines and I want this picture then to be made fresh to you today and that it will live on all through the week. If you just remember the picture of an old man running to hug his son and kiss him and put his arms around him and say, I'm I'm never going to let you go again. So firstly, we start three hours, the rebellion of the son. Jesus tells the story of a landowning father and his younger son came to him one day and he said, gimme. And it wasn't a brand new coat of many colors or a new stallion that he wanted, but he wanted his share of the estate. And receiving this, he would forfeit then any right he had to his father's land. All that remained then would pass to his older brother. Now, I was reading what a theologian wrote in explaining this, and this is what he said. When the father divided the property between the two sons, and the younger son turned his share into cash, this must have meant that the actual land that the father owned had been valued and then divided into two. The younger boy sold off his share to someone else. The shame that that would bring on the family would be added to the shame the son had already brought to the father by asking for his share before his father's death. It was the equivalent of saying, I wish you were dead. The father bore these two blows without recrimination. To this day, there are people in traditional cultures who find the story of that point quite incredible. Father, simply don't behave like that. This father, they think, should have beaten his son or thrown him out. There's a depth of mystery already built into this story before the son leaves home. I know um, in London, teenagers leave home and move into a flat with their friends. They leave a rural village and they come here. People come from all over the world. They They want to sail in rubber dinghies across the channel and and find refuge in, in Britain. But in Jesus' culture, what the boy was doing would would be shameful because now the younger son was abandoning his obligation to care for his father in old age. His father cared for him all the years that he was growing up. He he couldn't live independently before he was a teenager. 
And then he in turn, when his father was old and frail, he would care for his father. He cared more about his inheritance than dad. Then he gathered together all he had. He turned everything he possessed, flocks and herds, into cash. He was leaving once and for all, and nothing was left behind. He wasn't coming back. Everything was taken. He had no pleasure in the company of his father or his older brother, and he put as many miles as possible between himself and them. He found his whole life restricting. It was suffocating. It was narrow. And he was heading for a place very far from where he was raised. In fact, he went to another country, a distant country, verse 13. So he was choosing a life of paganism over the privileges of living in the promised land. He was turning his back on the covenant people of God like any boy or girl from a Christian home turns their back on the Christianity that's molded and shaped their parents and that's influenced them. He had nothing to do with it. He wants no reminders of God. And that's uh, an illogical, it's an impossible step for anyone to take because you can't escape from the omnipotent and the omniscient and the omnipresent and the omnicompetent God. We are as close to him in a pub, in a nightclub, as we are here today because where can we escape from the influences and the access God has to our conscience and our memories? At three o'clock tomorrow morning, he can wake you up and he can remind you of the gospel that you heard here today. Now, in that distant country, the, uh, the boy made many new friends, spoke another language, picked up new habits and traditions, wore a different style of clothes. Now I finally got away from all that I was that I hated so much, he thought to himself. Nobody knows me here. I can do whatever I want. There'll be no comments, no snide remarks, no criticism, nobody's frown. I won't face dad's disapproval. He answered to no one. And so he proceeded to taste all the forbidden pleasures and couldn't imagine what it would be like to return to the confines and the legalism of dad's house. It was not, you understand, that in the distant city he could go to weddings and 21st birthday parties and anniversary celebrations. All such activities are legitimate for us all. Jesus himself went to weddings and to feasts. This young man was unrestrained now in his sensuality, in his spendthrift extravagance. His motto was spend, 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 for tomorrow we might die. And in that process, he gathered around him a host of hangers-on. Every itch was scratched. Every appetite was satisfied. He deprived himself of no new sensation he sowed to the flesh thinking this is what life is all about this is the abundant life he never lacked companionship there were always cronies hanging on to him 
until the day came when his last shekel was spent. And he had nothing. And it went very quickly. And there were no more free hog roasts. No more hunting expeditions. No old wine to drink. No women to buy. He didn't have a penny in his pocket. He didn't have any savings. He had no family, no auntie to knock on her door and ask could he stay the night there. And all his fair weather friends left him. On top of all that, there was a recession that hit the country that caused a fierce caused by a fierce drought. There was dust everywhere and queues of people at the well and edginess and criticism came in. Starvation through the land. People were fleeing the city. The boom became bust and the dream had faded in the endless light of the blazing sun that shone upon them relentlessly day after day his friends no more and utterly alone he was confronted with this groaning world living under the curse of our father Adam and our own sins he could fall still lower for a Jew anything to do with pigs was bad enough for him to feed them as his new companions each day was more despicable. Could he fall any further? Yes, he was hungry enough to eat their food as his food. It was bad news. He not only herded the swine, he herded with them. He ate from the pig's own troughs. Sin is a hard master. He was in bondage to poverty among the pigs. And what began a few months earlier as one thrill after another ended in serfdom. He was like the party drinker who becomes a drunk. He was like the drug addict who becomes a user He was like the promiscuous person who gets AIDS. The party had become a prison. That is what sin does. It becomes our master. It tells us not to think of our souls, not to think of death, not to think of God, not to read the Bible, not to pray, not to go to church, and we obey it. For the scripture says that all the world is a prisoner of sin. You see the picture? You see the depths which this boy had fallen to? There was no redeeming feature about this man. From the time that he said goodbye to his father, put his money in, in a bag and set off not looking back. Ride on and on to the field of pigs. Now, there's an error here that I've got to avoid. And the error is to allegorize this parable and say the prodigal son is the sinner. You can say he's a type of every sinner who's a long way from God. And then before we know it, I'm saying to every man and woman and those middle-aged ladies of the utmost decorum there you are with the pigs and the prostitutes squandering all that your loving father has given to you that is not the message of this parable this man is not every man this man is not your run of the mill London sinner this man is how he is described in this parable. He's a rake. He's a fool. He's a drunkard. He's a waster. He's a derelict. He's a heartbreaker. 
That is what he is. He does not stand in this parable as a spiritual symbol of Mr. Everyman. He stands in this parable of a sinner in the pits as far as you can go, as low as you can fall, in the gutter, on the waterfront, on death row, in the bars of Soho. He is the extreme. He's thrown out of low company. If ever there was a son whom a father would refuse to have him back, it was this son. If ever there was a sinner, you can imagine God rejecting, it's this sinner, this prodigal, this Saul of Tarsus, this torturer, this Jesus hater, this gathering demoniac, this John Newton, this policeman, policeman, who takes a woman off the street and rapes and murders her. This suicide bomber, this bigger, this is not an ordinary unbeliever. This man is on the lowest rung of the ladder. He's an inch ab- above the surface, above the surface of the cesspit, and he's sinking into it. Faster and faster. We think of the angels watching, and the angels are talking to one another, and Gabriel is saying to Michael, what's God going to do with this one then? They're debating, uh, is he the worst They think of the wonderful privileges he had in his upbringing and all the money he had and how he contemptuously rejected that upbringing and wasted all that money. He said, is he the worst? You've seen, Michael. Was King Saul the worst? Was the gathering demoniac the worst? Saul of Tarsus, was he the worst? Or the prodigal son? Will will our Lord, will our Lord receive him? Would he come here to this place of joy and love to live with us forever? This one? So it means for you and me, that we can never think, let alone say, someone as bad as me for such a long time, falling repeatedly, making such a mess of my life, could never be saved. Can't say that. No one here can say words like that. We can think, we can imagine we're unique in our shame, so extraordinary, so guilty, so depraved, so abandoned, so far away from everything. No home to go to. Yet here is this man. It's the worst scenario that you will meet. The most abandoned of men, the most selfish of men, the most cruel, the most wretched, the most hopeless. He's the chief of sinners. And yet there's a road, there's a road from where this man is to where a loving father in heaven is. And there's a road this morning. That's why God has brought me here and why he's brought you here to tell you there's a road from where you are this morning to where there are arms outstretched to welcome you. Whatever you've done, whatever abandonness, whatever hypocrisy, whatever intellectual arrogance you've shown in your life, the pain you've caused to those who depend on you the most and love you the most, whatever it's been, wherever you are, Wherever you are this morning, 
there's a door. And the name Jesus is on that door. It's not locked. You push it. And you meet him. The second R is the repentance of the son. What's the theme that runs through this chapter? It's not that God rejoices in sinners. Not at all. It's that God rejoices in sinners repenting. It's there in verse 7. It's there in verse 10. So there's this word repentance. It's not a commonly used. You don't find it often on television, in the media. Politicians don't talk about repentance. What does it mean to repent? Well, the answer is here in this picture, in the prodigal son. Firstly, he came to his senses, didn't he? Verse 17, when he came to himself. When new period in his life, all the partying, all the drinking, all the women behind him, just him, the pigs. He realized what his life was. Now, at this moment, he knew where he was at. He's far from home. He was penniless, hopeless, disgraced, discredited, abandoned. And he came to himself. This isn't a typical sinner now. This is the chief. This is the worst. And it's true, it's true for everyone here that our return to God must involve a coming to ourselves, a facing up to what I am and what I have done with this unrepeatable life of mine. Maybe like This prodigal son, your life bears all the marks of perdition. Maybe your sin is notorious. When you come to yourself, you have 20-20 vision and you see it. It's one of the great marvels of the Bible, this book. Just on a literary level. It's absolutely superb. Why don't we read it more? You'd have thought that this young man would always have been aware of his condition every step of the way. There are some men, you know, you look at them, some neighbors, fellows in school, in university, people in your family, your distant family, cousins and so on, and you look at them and you think, they must know the truth about themselves. They have to know. The alcoholic knows. The pedophile knows. Uh, The drug addict is aware of what he's doing to his health. He realizes what he's doing to his wife, what he's doing to his children and his family, what he's doing to his friends in church. He must know. Surely he's come to himself, he's come to his senses. But you go to the Old Testament and you read there the life of King David and he'd committed horrible, foul Sins he'd taken uh, a woman from her husband. And he'd committed adultery with her. And then he'd murdered the husband. And he's not in the least troubled. He hasn't come to himself. There's no contrition at all. 
you thought he'd come to himself and that he tossed and turned all night and groaned. And Bathsheba said to him, what are you groaning about? Oh, you know. He didn't. God had to send a prophet to tell David that adultery is a sin and murder is a sin and he had committed those sins. Only then he came to himself. It's crucially important that you come to yourself. Do you know the first question that God asked fallen man the first thing that God said to man after man fell he said to him where are you Adam where are you where are you this morning where, where are you where are you in your life Just, where are you There are many people in London. Their sin is staring them in the face. Where are they? Where are they? They haven't come to their senses. We're standing in the forecourt of judgment. We're living in a moral universe. What a man sows, that also he will reap. It is appointed unto men once to die and after death. There's the evaluation. How have you lived with all the blessings, all the kindness and goodness that God has given to us? How is it now with you? And all that many have who are on a broad road All they have are the baubles and the gewgaws and the toys of our materialism, their computers, their games, the remnants of a career, some property, some family, some money, some memories. That's the lot. That's all they've got. They haven't come to themselves vanity of vanities all is vanity we have our goals we have our objectives we have our chief end we have our plans for the weekend this great phrase that's where we're going and we hope for some glittering prizes hope for more money and more recognition then we remember what John Milton said uh, that at the moment when we think the prize is in our grasp come the blind furies with their abhorred shears and they slit the thin spun line it's gone what do we got I don't want to sentimentalize. I think of some of the, the great leaders in, in the world, statesmen, in their declining years. Winston Churchill, Harold Wilson, Ronald Reagan. Great achievements, ego-reinforcing attainments of outstanding lives. Enormously influential figures with applauds and accolades they had from continents and nations. At the end, what did they have? What were they? It seems to speak to me so eloquently of the insubstantialness of human attainments. There was a man, and he was always on television until a couple of weeks ago, wasn't he? He was always making announcements, prophecies, warnings, and then... His sin was discovered. Don't see him anymore. Don't hear him anymore. There were those men. And I suppose at the end they they had no remembrance of their attainments. That they had been prime minister. 
that they'd been president of the United States. Repentance begins with you coming to yourself, with you going in and in and looking at your heart and looking at your life and seeing who you are and coming out of the shadowlands in which you've been living your life, coming to realistic self-evaluation, coming to truth. The gospel is not a call to fantasy. It's not a leap in the dark. It's just facing with judgment day honesty who you are, what you've done with your life. What is repentance? Well, it's coming to yourself. Secondly, it's remembering Father. Now, that word Father only occurs once in the parable so far, but in the next six verses, from the 17th verse onwards, it occurs seven times. It's that important. Shorter Catechism tells us that repentance begins with an apprehension of the mercy of God. That's where it begins. Ah, the living God. He's a God of pity, a God of love. He's a God of mercy. He's a God who for can forgive. You start by saying, oh, what a, what a mess I've made of things. And then you go on to think, but, but God might have mercy on me. You know, a person will never repent until he's got some hope. And we have to give a reason for the hope we have to everyone who asks you, why am I a man of hope? Why is this church, why has it got a message of hope to people who are at the end of their tethers? It might be a glimmer. It might be a maybe. But this, this boy had some encouragement that maybe, maybe his father who had not cursed him and quibbled with him but given him what he asked for, that going would be an encouragement. Jesus says, Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast him out. No way will I lock the door when I see him coming. No way will I say, it's not for you. You're too far gone. The Neumeister him, you know it, sinners Jesus will receive, sound this word of grace to all who their heavenly pathway leave, all who linger, all who fall, sing it o'er and o'er again. Christ receiveth sinful men. Make the message clear and plain. Christ receives sinful men. Don't care who you are, where you've been, where you spent last night, doesn't matter. If you come to him, sorrowful for your sin, there's no way you're going to be cast out. There's that hope. There's that glimmer. It's like a little candle burning in the night that's all, that's all you need what had caused this change in this boy well let me tell you, somewhere in this boy's growing up they had been impressed indelibly on his consciousness that whenever things went wrong and when they went badly wrong, he could always go home. He must always come back. He hadn't been taught, if you bring disgrace on this family, then never come back. He hadn't been conditioned to the view, if you let us down, don't bother to come back. If you bring shame on our name, stay away. He'd been told. And he saw this truth lived out in the practice of this father. 
however low you go. However deep the abyss. However appalling the degradation. You must always feel, son, this is your home. This is your home. And you return. And I would beg and plead with the parents here this morning that they give this this message with absolute and unconditional security that your sons and daughters know it. That if they face the ultimate in tragedy, they can still come home. If they become drunkards, they can come home. If they marry their own people, they can come home. If they get AIDS, they can come home. If they get pregnant, they can come home. If they have an abortion, they can come home. If they end up in jail, you'll be visiting and they can come home at the end. They must have. They need to have that assurance. It's one of the basic elements in divine pedagogy. That is how our Father teaches us to train our children. He wants to be exemplified in our fatherhood, his fatherly mercy and love. It gives them this security. The boy came to his senses and he leaves the distant city and all its wretched memories. And where can he go? The home on the hill, the farm the dad farms. That is repentance. It's a double turning from the love of the world and the things of the world, from the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, from all of that, a turning from that, a turning to God, our Father, in hope of his mercy. What else is repentance? He came to his father with imperfect faith. The boy turned and as he made his way, he he started to rehearse to himself what he would say when his father looked at him. Uh, He would say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. I am not worthy to be called your son Make me like one of your hired men. Uh, this boy now walking so slowly back from the boy who walked out with such excitement and so many high plans for the fun he was going to have, the liberty he would have. He was full of doubt, the kind of welcome that he would receive from a family he had abused and taken advantage of. He'd broken their hearts. So he'd make a little speech. He would say to his father, I can never be a member of the family again, but when you go to hire men in the marketplace and and they are standing around waiting to be employed, and you see me there, while on others you are calling, do not pass me by. Call me. Invite me to work for you. Hire me, he says. Those are his thoughts. That he would make peace with his father by lowly expectations and requests. He'd lost all self-respect. All his vaunted wisdom was a handful of pebbles. He lost his self-respect. Maybe I can be a hired servant and work for my father again. He couldn't believe in the vastness of the grace of his father. 
he has such an inadequate shrinking view of dad's love he was so small and you remember when he begins his speech how his father cuts him down he doesn't let him finish his speech you you don't have to say anything there's no formula in other words that I'm giving to you when you become a Christian sometimes it's one word Jesus and God reads your heart Jesus it's all you can say Jesus sorry I wish it wasn't me have pity forgive accept me you have to say it from where you are just as you are to the one just as he is full abounding in mercy and love and grace so that's my second point the boy's repentance the boy's rebellion the boy's repentance and then the boy's return it's a tremendous welcome for this teenage debauchee this man from the far country he turns the corner of the house he sees the, or the lane he sees the old house and he slows down he's fearful he remembers the speech that he's going to make and he's dreading what his father is going to think and how will he react the father he's hurt so much he's dreading he's asking himself well, what's he how can I diffuse the situation how can I put him in a good mood the father often looked out of the window up the lane and one day he saw a figure and he recognized the figure who he was and it filled his heart with joy and compassion a pitiable figure a boy so thin so bedraggled so wretched and undernourished and weak filthy with the smell of the swine still on him shame and fear written on his face but he'd come home it was enough his father ran out to him, he left the farm door open. He ran across the farmyard and through the gate, his old legs running towards his son, lest the boy funk the meeting and turn away and walk away. Couldn't do it, so ashamed. And when his father reaches him, he wraps his arms around him and he sobs out his love. And he wets his son's cheeks with his tears and he kisses him just as he used to when he was a little boy and carry him to bed and kiss him and tell him how much he loved him and put him down for the night's sleep I'll never let you go again he said and that's only the beginning of the welcome the servants come panting along and he barks out his orders get the best robe you know it's in the wardrobe of the bedroom and the ring that's in the drawer there, the chest of drawers, and the sandals, the fatted calf, slaughter it. We're having a feast. He doesn't say to the boy, what have you done with my money? How could you have got into such a mess? What a shape you're in. He doesn't say to him, do you know what disgrace you brought on the family? Do you know the anxiety that your mother's lost weight? Every day she cries about you. Do you know what we felt all the time you were away? Why didn't you think of getting in touch with us? None of that. None of that at all. None of that whatsoever. There's a party taking place. The musicians are tuning their fiddles. There's the sound of men and women gathering. The message spreads, good news spreads. And there's dancing. 
because the son of the owner was dead and he's alive. He was lost. He's found. And everything is forgotten for the joy of restoration. It's resurrection day on the farm. So they began to celebrate. So let me close. What does this mean in simple teaching? If you can reduce such emotions, such delight, such joy to words, it is speaking of the joy in God. It's in the midst of the angels of heaven and God. God is rejoicing. God is rejoicing. The creator of heaven and earth the God who is infinite, eternal, unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness and truth. This God is rejoicing because you have kneeled before God and asked for his mercy. Make you a real Christian. Um. That's the joy. The joy, of course, is in the welcome that he gives to his children. In the gifts he gives us. He gives us all we need from from the moment we're converted. He does so much. He freely pardons all our sin, all our past sin, all our present sin, all our future sin. Forgiven. The slate is clean. Absolutely. Absolutely. What wonderful eloquence in the father's silence. Sin written all over the boy's face. The taste of the world had destroyed his appearance. Father doesn't mention it. God doesn't hurl our pasts at us. He forgives. He freely pardons all our sin. We who are so unsanitary become as clean and white as newly fallen snow. Your sins that were red like scarlet are whiter than snow. I, I'm sure the boy had... I, I, I'm sorry, Dad. Oh, Dad, I made a mess of things. I'm so sorry. Do you want to talk about it? That's what Christians do. We bring up our past. We're worried about what we've done. Can God simply consign the thing I grieve about the most, the most cruel and horrible thing I've done? And God just casts it into the depths of the ocean and does not consider it. We'll never consider it. Again, there is therefore now no condemnation. There's no tut-tuts. There's no raising of an eyebrow. There's no a sternness. A slight frown. None of that. The past is past. The past is past for you, Christian. You remember it now. It's past. We forget the things that are past. Then we made sons. It's not, well, we're on probation for five years. We've got to pee at the back of our lives like a, mm. the newly passed driving test car. Yes, we're, we're, we're learners. Not that. The best robe. Sonship. The best ring. On the finger, sonship. The sandals on our feet, slaves, servants, they don't wear sandals. Only sons, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. The father makes him a son. He wanted to be a a slave, a hired servant. My son. My dear son, heir of salvation, purchase of God, 
born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is our story. This is our song. We're tempted, you see, to say, I I don't deserve this, Father. I, I just want a little blessing from you on my life. I, I've fallen. I, I don't know if I'm good enough to ca- carry on as, as a Christian. I, I, I can't live up. What if I bring disgrace on you again, Father? Can I make it? Can I be a saint? Can I be holy? Can I keep going? We bring all those things as new Christians, as young Christians. We bring them. We bring them to God. Can we keep going? We come poor in spirit. And he greets us and he fills us with his spirit. All we need to live for the glory of God, he gives to us. He joins us to Christ. We are plugged into Jesus Christ. We are a branch that's grafted in the vine and his life. And his life in its love and joy and peace comes to us and keeps coming. Oh, love that will not let us go. The boys started with the pigs. And he said, I've come to myself. I'm going back to dad. No one ever became a Christian without making a decision like that. I want decisions from you today. You understand? I want you all, no exceptions, none at all. The worst, the youngest, doesn't matter. I want you to make a decision this morning. I want you to say, I'm going to my Father who is in heaven. You you make up your mind now. You make up your mind to do that. The prodigal son was transformed. And his recovery was achieved by coming to himself and remembering his father's mercy and making a decision that he was going home. He was determined. And without that, all his grief and all his regrets and all his longing and all his rehearsal was futile. Many boys and girls, many men and women hesitate at the third point. They've come to terms with themselves. They've decided to go to God for mercy and they've decided they're going to make that decision. But not yet. And some of you are thinking, still, not yet but what saved this man wasn't only coming to himself and making a decision that he would go home what saved him verse 19 he got up and he went to his father where have Where have many of you stopped? Have you stopped at the point of admitting you're a penniless sinner? Many think that. But they stop there. At point two, I know that God is merciful. But many stop there. Or that third point, I'll make a decision. One day. Isn't it tragic that you come so far? You come so near to the border of the kingdom of God. and You hesitate. You don't go. You don't go over the border. You don't come into the kingdom of God. You don't. And I'm putting it to you. That it, it all hangs on those words. He got up and went. It's 
suppose you had all the knowledge of the Bible in the world, that you memorized the shorter catechism. You had all the conviction of sin in the world. All the spiritual hunger in the world, all the moral reformation that you weren't ever going to go those ways again. If that boy hadn't gone home, he would never have known the embrace and tears and love and hugs of a father he had hurt who freely forgave him and welcomed him back as a son. If you ask me what saved the boy, I would say it was the abundant pardoning love of the father. If you ask me what saved this boy, I would say the journey back home. Both of those. It's always both. And that's the journey I want you to make. From where you are now, here, in the state you are in, I want you to make a decision. You're going to make a journey now. In faith, you're going to go to our Heavenly Father. You're not going to leave this church as you came in. You're going to have dealings with God. You're going to speak to him. The one who is slow to be angry and great in long-suffering. Ah, yes, let's come to ourselves. That's a wonderful thing, to come to yourself. It's a wonderful thing to believe in the mercy of God. And let's make up our minds that, yeah, oh, We've got to go to God. We've got, to, we've got to go to Jesus Christ. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. That's what he promises. But after you've done all that, come. Come to Jesus Christ. Go to him. Make the journey from this distant country to the home of your Father in heaven. Let's start now. No more delays, no more excuses, no more putting it off. You come now to your Father. It's a movement of your, your heart, the dispositional complex of Feelings and convictions, they're the real you. As the word of God is brought by the Holy Spirit to your heart. And you say, I'm coming to him. I'm going to come to him. And you come to him. And you speak to him. Come now. If not now, when? If not to the Lord Jesus, to whom are you going to go? He brought me here today. He's given me a word to give to you. He brought you here today and given you the word. He's laid it on your heart. You come now. You come now. Don't say no to God. Let's pray. Lord, you brought us here today, and you're here today, and you've been working in our hearts, and you've been speaking to us, and there's been saving power here, which only the presence of Jesus can, can accomplish. Oh, please, in your, in your kindness and in your mercy, please save all of us who are lost, Everyone, don't let one defy you. But each one, just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Help us, we pray, to say that. We ask it for your glory and in Jesus' name, amen.